know what we are talking of when we talk of PaO2 and saturation. Coming to the important concept of tissue oxygenation, so now we spoke of uh, oxygen uptake into the blood and carriage in the hemoglobin. Now tissue oxygenation is actual delivery of the oxygen to the tissues. So it depends on oxygen content in the blood. Oxygen content in the blood depends on how much hemoglobin is there as well as how effective the oxygenation is in the lungs. So if a child is anemic, for example, or if a baby is anemic, they have a lower content of hemoglobin and uh, their ability to carry oxygen is limited. To some extent, this is offset by increased cardiac output, as we will discuss, uh, by increasing the heart rate. So anemia causes tachycardia for the same reason. Uh, efficacy of oxygenation in the lungs, obviously, in a normal situation, it doesn't matter. But in the case of lung disease like pneumonia or respiratory distress syndrome, where the oxygenation is not happening normally, this plays an important role because if the oxygen is not getting into the blood in the first place, the tissues are not going to get enough oxygen. And that's where our importance of uh, FiO2 that we breathe in, the need for pressure uh, support, the need for surfactant, all these come in. Uh, the next important part that affects tissue oxygenation is the cardiac output and the tissue perfusion. So uh, cardiac output is a component uh, where stroke volume is uh, times the heart rate gives you the cardiac output. So cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate and the stroke volume is contributed by the preload which is the amount of blood returning back to the heart. So that uh, indicates how much filling of the atrium is there. Uh, the degree of stretching of the atrium, the Frank Starling law applies and that affects the myocardial contractility. So if the heart is not filled adequately, uh, the st stretching of the muscle doesn't happen, the pump may not work as effectively. That's where you may need inotropic. And uh, when we talk of uh, afterload, that is the resistance to the heart pumping in the rest of the systemic circulation. So if there is a peripheral vasoconstriction, your afterload is high. And when we give inotropes, for example, like uh, dopamine or dobutamine or any other medication, we have to think of how they impact on all these components. So a vasodilator, for example, reduces the afterload. It makes it easier for the heart to pump. Uh, most of these medications increase the heart rate. And so the heart rate goes up, the cardiac output may increase. However, if the heart rate goes up too much, uh, your preload may be reduced and the uh, filling of the atria reduces so the contractility is not going to be as effective so excessive increase in heart rate is not a good thing in these situations and again if you use a strong uh, medication like dopamine which causes peripheral vasoconstriction to increase the blood pressure numbers the numbers go up but actually if the pump is already failing the heart has to pump even harder so it doesn't necessarily improve the outcome for the patient that's why we should be very careful about the choice of the uh, uh, medication we are using to support the blood pressure. If you don't have enough filling, the preload is an issue and we may need to give more volume. If myocardial contractility is an issue, you give inotropic agents and possibly something to lower the afterload like a mild vasodilator like a milrinone is a good choice in these situations. And if a myocardial contractility is good but the systemic uh, vessels are dilated for example you may give uh, dopamine to increase the peripheral vascular resistance that will improve the blood pressure so oxygen content uh, is basically the amount of uh, oxygen uh, that is dissolved in the blood in the hemoglobin one gram of fully saturated hemoglobin carries 1.3 ml of oxygen and uh, a small amount dissolves in the plasma. So this is a very small percentage, 0.0031 ml per deciliter of blood. So for all practical reasons, this can be ignored, except that this is the measure that we use for the PaO2 on the blood gases. This correlates usually with the extent of uh, saturation. However, we should remember that saturation reflects the saturation of whatever hemoglobin is there in the child. So if you have only 10 grams of hemoglobin, your actual content of oxygen will be low, but the saturation may still be normal. So you should remember that anemia is one factor we should think of in terms of oxygen content of the blood. So uh, normal oxygen content is approximately 20 ml of oxygen per deciliter, depending on the site from which the blood is sampled. Obviously, arterial blood has more oxygen content 
and uh, it drops to the capillaries and then in the venous blood the whatever is extracted is subtracted from this total so as i said in the steady state four to five ml per deciliter is utilized in the tissue so the venous blood will have about five ml less so 15 ml in the venous blood we have a substantial reserve if the blood flow is reduced or demand for oxygen increases so you can say five times or four times the reserve in normal conditions uh, after we have the oxygen content we look at oxygen delivery this is the amount of oxygen transported from the lungs to the microcirculation Oxygen delivery depends on the cardiac output and the oxygen content of the blood. And as the cardiac output in the newborn is about 250 ml per kilo per minute, and the oxygen content is 20 ml per deciliter, uh, that means uh, 20 uh, ml per deciliter and 250 is 2.5 times that, it's 50 ml per minute is the oxygen delivery in normal conditions. After you get to the oxygen delivery, we talk of the oxygen consumption, which is actually the amount consumed in the peripheral tissue. So once the blood reaches from the arterioles to the capillary circulation, oxygen goes into the tissue uh, as per the needs of the tissue and the rest of it will stay in the blood, which comes back to the venous circulation. So the difference between the arterial and the venous oxygen will give you the oxygen consumption and that is multiplied by the uh, cardiac output and uh, the resting oxygen consumption as we discussed earlier is 4.5 to 7 ml per kg per minute and uh, suppose you are uh, studying for the exam for example or you are preparing for a presentation your brain is working more so your oxygen consumption in the brain is more if you are sleeping or you are just watching a video to relax you may be finding a lower consumption in the brain so brain is actually a uh, quite avid user of both glucose and oxygen that's why if you are sitting through a whole day in the clinic you feel tired even though you have not done any physical activity uh, when we talk of oxygen measurement we'll be talking a little bit about near infrared spectroscopy and this is the tool which actually measures or monitors the uh, oxygen consumption in the tissue so you actually